Well, I think I have to go up here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship this morning. Great to have you all with us. It's a special day for us, and uh, we will celebrate all the work that has gone into this and God's blessing and all of that. Uh, we will explain as we go. We also have uh, Dave Rakowski from Love, Inc. He's going to be with us this morning for a bit. And... Um, yeah, there's a lot to celebrate, plus we have all the normal things. Just a few announcements before we begin. Um, a reminder for everyone who is a confessing member, after the blessing, so those of you who are visiting and or not confessing members, be patient with us. Go grab a cup of coffee. We have to go through the budget and one ballot, so it should take us 10 minutes unless somebody gets rowdy. Uh, so maybe even less than that if we're really on top of it. So we, we will join you in a moment after we vote on office bearers and the 2024 budget. That will be after the blessing. So please don't take off and we'll fellowship with you as soon as that work is done. Uh, once again, uh, volunteer sheets. We need your updated contact information, so please... Please send that along. Uh, an announcement from Be Amazed. They will be caroling, so it's at the very top of the announcements there. Take a look at that, and if you have any questions for Amy, talk to Amy. Honduras trip. Now's the time to be signing up, correct? Talk to Larry, Ann, and whoever else is involved in that. And then um, Operation Christmas Child. Are we still trying to accept for shipping, some donation? Always accepting for shipping, so... You, the spirit may move this morning, so you can see Sylvia or Lori on that. And then uh, Cookie Dough Frolic, we have one more, December 16th. Uh, so those who are interested in helping with that, please see Carol, Carolyn. So I think that is it. I think we will also plan to have R&R &R, uh, this morning, too. So after the dust settles over all this stuff. So, so with that, uh, we're... We're going to be talking about prayer and confession today because Daniel confesses in chapter 9. And I want to read Psalm 130 uh, before we quiet our hearts to take in what the psalmist says about the importance of confession and then the forgiveness that God gives us through that. So Psalm 130, just take these words in. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? And the answer is no one. But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Let us quiet our hearts. The living God greets you this morning. The one who gives you his mercy, forgives your sins, and gives you new life, calls you to worship this morning. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. As the Lord greets us, let's take a moment and greet each other. Good morning. Uh, we're going to lift up our voice in song this morning as we worship our Lord. Have you come to the end? 
Dear Lord, thank you for gathering us here this morning. Thank you for the reminder of how much we need you, whether it's in the small things of the day-to-day -day hustle or in the large things like diagnoses and surgeries and death in the family. Lord, we need you. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for just the opportunity to praise you this morning, free of worry. But God, we are blessed. We need you. Uh, teach us something this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Dave, welcome this morning. Love in the name of Christ. Great to have you here. Give us an update. And uh, Dave will try to stay around as much as he can, but he's got to go back and teach Bible study at his church. So he may scoot out. If you see that, that's what's going on there. So let me make sure you're on. And that way, if anything happens, it's my fault. Should be no electric current in that at all. <laughs> welcome. Well, that's a great start to a special worship service this morning, isn't it? I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me to come here this morning. Uh, it is a privilege. It's always a privilege to talk about our mission here at Love, and, and it's part of your mission, too, because you're one of our supporting churches, and we thank you so much for that. You've been with us since, I think, the beginning of Love, and been one of our stronger supporters. We, we appreciate that very much. Um, You go to the second slide there. Maybe not. There we go. You know, getting churches together sometimes can be a problem. But we all have different, because we all have different theologies and what we do. But in Matthew 22, Jesus commanded um, Christians, to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole mind, and with, with your soul. And the second commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. That's where love comes in. We try, if you, if you, picture, if you picture a wheel, love being the hub of that wheel, and each one of those spokes represents a church. Our job is to coordinate that, that wheel so that it, it works like it's supposed to. Um, and then the, the outside being the needs of the people around us. I have a short video that's on the next slide there. We'll take a look at that a minute, and then we'll get into a little more of what we're doing. We are Love, Inc. That's not incorporated, but rather in the name of Christ. We are a non-denominational ministry on a mission to mobilize local churches to transform lives and communities in the name of Christ. Simply put, we help churches help people. Why? Because we believe there's nothing more powerful than churches working together as the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, every Christian church, regardless of denomination, is called to serve their neighbors and share their resources. 
they are called to walk with people who are struggling within their walls and out in their community. So where do we come in? Love Inc. connects the calling of local churches to the struggles of the community. Here's how Love Inc. works. A community member with a need calls a local church. This could be a simple request, like diapers for their child or food for their family or something bigger, like a bed for their daughter, a ride to a medical appointment or some other type of support. And they ask, can you help me? The church can say, yes, we partner with other churches so that we can. Call Love Inc. to learn more. So they call and we pick up. We listen to them. We get to know them, their strengths and struggles, their hopes and dreams. We want to know about more than their current crisis because we're not just about meeting needs. We're about meeting people where they're at and caring for them holistically. Then through Love Inc's network of churches and community relationships, we work to help. Diapers are provided by one church, groceries by another, Rides are arranged with caring church volunteers, while classes and mentoring are provided by others. And it's all coordinated by Love Inc. So at every step, our neighbors are met with dignity and respect, while our partner churches are free to focus on serving according to their strengths, knowing that each individual will be fully cared for by the body of Christ within their community. The result, transformed lives transformed churches, and transformed communities. Will you join us in this work? Visit loveinc.org to find out more or contact your local Love Inc. to get connected in your community. All right, here's some of the things, that, the reasons why we have Love Inc. Um, the first one assists churches in going beyond benevolence to building life-changing relationships. We have found that talking to the people, we not only can build a relationship, but we can also find out what's really going on in their lives. And then we can work with them to change that. Many of the people that come to us are one bad choice away from being in, in, a, in a critical situation. So... If we can solve that beforehand, why it just helps them to grow um, and be the people that God wants them to be. But it also gives us the opportunity to share the gospel with them. That's probably our most important means that we have of, of reaching them. Um, there are times when we have to say no. We've had times when um, we've looked at the person and looked at their situation and found out that there really wasn't a need there. I, I worked in benevolence at my church for eight years. Twice we had people that come to us that um, were abusing the system. Now, we'd rather err on the side of compassion rather than being judgmental, but God has called us to be good stewards of our money also. So we have to do that. We have to, we have to vet the, the, the need and make sure that it's correct. Um, all right, we're going <laughs> to... Also, during that time, we can also look at different um, patterns that we see throughout the community so that we can address those needs. We have churches that have set up, and your church has, has been just so beneficial in providing space for us to do our classes. We also have churches that do a vehicle repair ministry. We have some that do, um, I have to look at my list, there are so many, food pantries, clothing pantries, um, a laundry ministry, a bed ministry, a baby pantries, personal care pantries, um, and then a cleaning bucket of all things. <laughs> but there, the need's there, and we've seen the need because of the interviews that we've been doing. So those are all important things. Uh, I know that for churches, sometimes it can be a burden if they try and take on everything themselves. But because we have this network of churches, that spaces that out between all the churches. It, it takes away some of the burden from some of the churches and you know, kind of spreads it around. It makes it a lot easier. 
Uh, let's, if we go back to, please. All right, and a, lot, a lot of times too, on the third one there, a lot of times churches become the means for people. Once they, they go to a church and, and the church helps them out, then the next time they need it, they're right back to that same church again. It, keeps, it, it creates a dependency. Going through Love, Inc., they come to love. We can control that. And it doesn't make the church look bad. Then it makes us look bad, which if we have to say no, that's all right. We're here to protect the church. We're here to serve the church. All right, now we can go on the next slide, please. All right. Uh, one of the m most important parts of love right now is the help center. That's where the people will come to us and we interview them and build that relationship. You know, we receive requests, screen requests, and then refer them to a church for help. Um, that's where our gaps are identified. All right, um, I want to read, just, just to give you a little update of where we are right now, too. During COVID, our requests just dropped right off. We had maybe one request a week, something like that. Um, and then for a while after that, and I think that was probably because the government was supplying so much during that time period that people just didn't have the needs. They were being met by the governor. That's not the way scripture says it's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be the church that supplies those needs for those individuals. Um, okay, here, here's a, recently we had this gal come into our church. Let me read this for you. A neighbor came into love in the name of Christ because she needed some brake work done in her car. Her brakes had gone out completely. She's a single, working mother who had worked at a present job for the last seven years. In the past month, however, her work hours were reduced due to a UAW strike. Because of reduced hours at work, she's having a hard time making ends meet. She believes, and she had used up all of her savings at that point. Uh, she believes in God, but feels she doesn't need to attend the church to believe. At the end of the intertake, she started to cry and couldn't understand why people would help her without judgment. She was helped by one of the local churches and a volunteer from the church. They did the brake job on her, on her car. It was difficult for her to come in and request help. She had always made it on her very own. However, this time she had to ask for help. Love in the name of Christ keeps in con we'll keep, we're keeping in contact with her. And the last time we spoke to her, she'd been called back to work. Now, I want to take a little scenario here. If the churches and love had not been there for her and her, her car was not functional, when she called back to work, was called back to work, she wouldn't have had transportation. And that would have spiraled into not being able to pay her rent, not being able to buy food. It just makes them go deeper and deeper into the situation, it makes it harder for them. So just sometimes just that little thing that we do can make such a huge difference in their thing, in their lives. We had, um, I don't know if I said this, but we, our, our number of requests have almost back to where we were pre-COVID. We're starting to see a lot of people coming in through the doors right now. Uh, we had one lady that was abused by her husband, had no place to go, no home, no food, no clothes. She had walked out of the house with, without anything. We got her taken care of. We got her in a house through um, True North, helped us with that. So we also have agencies that we can work with that, that can help in those situations also. Um, got her taken care of. We have, right now, presently, we have a family that the, the husband is um, disabled. The wife does work. They have four kids. They, when they came to us, they had been without water for, for three weeks. No water for three weeks in a family of, of five. Um, 
they drilled her well yesterday at a cost of $7,500. We're still trying to come up with the money for that. <laughs> but um, so if you feel so inclined, <laughs> but those are just situations that we have that uh, on a daily basis that we're seeing. And because of churches like yours, we're able to help these people. So the blessing is not just for us, it's for you also. Because it's you, you're the ones that are making it happen. So we appreciate all that you do in helping us to, to help others. Thank you. Mayor Dave, can I pray for you? So I can't say enough good things about Love, Inc. When I served in Nuevo County, they did a great job there. They help us do things that we can't do or probably shouldn't do. So uh, thank you for all the years. Let's pray together um, for this ministry. Heavenly Father, thank you for the relationship we have with Love, Inc. and the work you've called them to do. And thank you, Lord, for helping us partner with them. We ask, Lord, for blessings as uh, things go back to normal need times before covid Lord, help us to be wise, but also help us to be loving and caring and compassionate. Thank you for Dave and Nancy, and we ask, Lord, for your blessings upon Love, Inc. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Thanks. Thanks for being here. You can catch him later if you have any questions. Or call him, yes. Email him. Go down and serve a little. So as you can see, uh, we had quite switching gears to... OCC here, we've had quite a lot of work and a lot of effort that everybody put in. So Sylvia and Lori, are you here to come up? Do you want to say a few things? I know a few boxes were added this morning, so our total has gone up probably even more. So we're up to uh, 6,422. Is that what it is? That's what it feels like anyway. <laughs> here you are. Good morning. This is... Um, 2023. Um, our rough estimate going into today was 592. And so we'll have a total total after we pack them up today after church and send them on their way. Today they go on to the next step um, on the way to Chicago to get ready to go to the processing center. Um, this is awesome. These boxes are filled with love. Um, people have worked all year for this. They have sewn, they have crafted, they have fundraised, they have gifted, they have shopped, you name it, for this last year. And that's what's in these boxes. So that is about what? Probably 600 gospel opportunities to children in the poorest areas of this world. And so we are excited to be able to do this and Sunday's on their way today. I already know that there are people working on 2024, so just keep that in mind as you're <laughs> going about today. Wow, this has been so great. Do you remember when Pastor Rick had thrown out a number that was way above what we ever thought that we could do? And he said, well, let's just shoot for 500, right? Man, and now we have less people. And, you know, in Luke, Luke 10, verse 2, it says that the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, right? So it says, pray to the Lord. He is the king of the harvest, right? Pray to the Lord, and the laborers will come. Well, last week, we had the volunteers in our um, pack, our soup pack, super packing party. Yes. You know, when you get older, right? Um, <laughs> so we, we had the highest number of people there and it was awesome. The kids, we had only 15 kids the night that they did it, which was only a couple nights before, um, our packing party last Sunday. And within a half an hour, they had a hundred boxes packed and they were nice, good boxes. Um, we have a standard, right? And we, um, we feel really good about all of you helping us to put good boxes together. Um, so 
we have prayed, Lori and I always assess and say, is this where God wants us? Is this where God wants NERC to be plugging into this ministry? And God shows up all the time. And 600 boxes just blows our mind. And I guess this is where we're supposed to be. So this is a great thing. I want the kids to come up because they did a lot of it. Come on over, kids. And then I want all of you to come up. Um, and we are going to bless this, these boxes on the next part of, our, of the journey. They are going to Nuera Bible Church this afternoon um, where the, um, they will then go to the next. There's only nine of them in the United States of the next um, processing centers. Whew. And um, <laughs> and we will have in those boxes. Each of these boxes are going to have their translated um, curriculum, so that they can get to know and love Jesus like we do. And that is their opportunity. What a cool thing! So, six hundred times, right? To for them to know God. So come up, come up. And uh, you guys want to pray with us? Pastor Ben is going to lead us in prayer. All of you, too, please come up. Lay hands. We're going to lay hands on the boxes. If you can't reach a box, lay hands on people that connect to the boxes, okay? And also, uh, Brock wants help after oh, taking 600 yes. box out. I'm, I know his wife is going to forget, so I'll do it on his behalf. So. Thank you. Yes, we, so uh, we have to trailer. pack them in cartons and then pack them into our trailer. So yes. please, right after church, okay. help us. Everybody get in there. Can we make room for everyone? If we have to make a chain, feel free. This is a big thing for us, so let us, let us ask for God's blessings on this. Heavenly Father, you have called us to do this work, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless that work, that the things that are in these boxes would be an avenue for people to come to know you in different parts of the world. Lord, may you bless them, may they get there safely for all the workers who will touch these boxes beyond here, for New Era Bible Church and others, Lord, bless all of the effort. May you be pleased by this. We give you thanks for all the people you have helped raise up to work on this. And Lord, uh, thank you for Sylvia and Lori leading the way, and then all those who have come alongside them and helped put all this together. Thank you for letting us be part of your kingdom work. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Yes, maybe a little round of applause for all this, eh? Praise God, yeah. Well, Pastor Craig, good to see you here. Uh, we've had a bunch of hospital things go on this week, and Craig was right in the middle of that. Uh, he is feeling great and is here with us this morning uh, after spending some time in emergency. And yeah, so praise God. I'm going to follow some of the prayers on your prayer sheet. Um, there's a lot going on. Obviously, um, Sarah passed away this week, uh, John Annette's daughter-in-law. Um, so there's just a lot of uh, hurt there and a, long, a lot of mourning. And then um, we will continue to pray for um, Aaron, and uh, there's a few others there that we will lift up in prayer. So with that, uh, we have the highs and lows of life right here in a worship service, right? Um, we give praise for the boxes and for Love, Inc., and then we're, we're mourning also just the sadness that life does not um, go so smoothly on earth. So let us go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we come together as your people and we, we pray to you, Lord, uh, because the, the burdens of this broken life is sometimes just too heavy. We pray to, you to give you praise and we thank you for who you are. And then we also have these burdens that come with us as we live through life on earth. And we, the consequences of the fall, the slow redemption that Christ has, be, be, has begun and is making new, but we still live in that time where there's a lot of brokenness. Father, we pray for the world that we live in. There are wars raging, 
And we ask, Lord, that you would bring resolution and justice and also peace to those situations. We pray for our leaders, whether it's in our country, whether it's at our local state level or our local town level. We ask, Lord, that you would give them your spirit and the wisdom that comes with him. And may the spirit guide them to make wise decisions. Lord, we also pray that as a congregation, you would help us as we navigate difficult things going on in our denomination and the things that are going around in the culture around us. It is hard to be the light and it's hard to be focused with all of that. Give us strength, Father. Lord, we also have a, a myriad of illnesses and sicknesses and surgeries and doctor visits and all of that going on. We thank you that Craig is back with us and Lord, thank you for him and Susan and for the work through doctors and all the things that happened and how we ended up in the ER and now he's feeling great and he's here. Thank you for that and thank you for the miracle of modern medicine. Lord, we also pray for uh, Barry as he is going through uh, rehab and still has some fluid buildup. Pray, Lord, that you would resolve that and rehab would go well. Along that line, uh, we pray for Dick Fleming, who is going through extensive rehab. Pray that you would continue the healing for him and that uh, he would be able to get moving around. We also pray that for Alan, who is recovering from back surgery. Pray that um, his pain levels would drop and that he would be able to be up and around soon. Lord, we lift up um, uh, John and Annette and Brian and the girls who had to say goodbye to Sarah this week. They're young, they're 17, 15, and to lose their mom from cancer is just a hard thing to go through. May you protect them, and may you lift them up in this time of sorrow. Help us to mourn with them. Help us to lift them up as best we can with words of encouragement. And Lord, may your healing touch be upon their hearts this morning. We also pray for Aaron Stevens as we... Um, are waiting for all the details of the diagnosis. Uh, they're working on treatment plans now and just ask, Lord, that um, it would be effective and that the cancer would be pushed back. We also pray for uh, Terry Burrows. She's beginning chemo treatment for breast cancer. We ask, Lord, that this would be effective and that between the doctors and the medicine and your healing touch, she would come out of this well. Lord, we are at your mercy, even if we don't want to be. And we need your grace every moment, even if we don't think we do. And so this morning, Lord, as we deal with all the blessings and the struggles, may we look to you. May our eyes be on you. Sometimes we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Lord. We thank you for listening to us. Thank you for all your mercy and grace. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Our next act of worship is our offering. It is for the general fund. So can I have deacons come forward, please?
and uh, join us as we uh, sing a song of preparation. As you are ready to open the scriptures and hear from Pastor Ben. As we open the scriptures and hear from uh, Pastor Ben, Lord, we ask that we can uh, learn something new this morning, that we can be a, a light to this community, that we can be a blessing to our neighbors here, um, but Lord, that we can just remember that in everything we do, it's for you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Before we go to Daniel 9, we are going through a sermon series on prayer. This is our last Old Testament passage. Next week, we'll go into Acts where the church prays boldly to be a witness to the world. Uh, so that'll be an interesting one. And then we end there, we'll go into Advent. So um, we will, and we also have a Thanksgiving service this week. So there was an announcement for you just as I'm thinking of that. Before we go to God's word, let's go to the Heidelberg Catechism. Why do we need to pray? Just for, it's kind of a fun thing to do. Why do Christians need to pray? 
the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us. And also because God gives his grace and the Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking him for them. So would you ever think of praying as part of your gratitude towards God for all that he's done through his son for you? Is that new? Or is that... And then what he also says in there, we have to continually ask and seek and knock for the Holy Spirit, according to Luke. And so they incorporate that in that first question. Question 117, how does God want us to pray so that he will listen to us? So there's a, hold on, there's implied there, we can pray incorrectly, right? Okay, answer. First, Second, third, So there's a whole lot of things in this question and answer about being real with God, our need and our misery, hiding nothing. How many of us come to prayer with false pretenses as if we can outmaneuver God, right? I think this question and answer does a really nice job just telling us this is why we pray and this is how our posture should be, knowing that we don't even deserve God to listen to us but he will because of Christ. So with that, let us go to Daniel chapter 9. As I wrestled with this passage all week, I said to myself, why did you pick this one, Ben? Because the prayer is great, but the ending is really complicated, and I wish, well, it is what it is, and I was stretched. So chapter 9, we're going to read the whole thing. It ends with this apocalyptic ending that's... Uh, may stir the dinner conversations about the 77s and all that good stuff. It should be fun, I hope. So let us begin in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servant, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, we and our kings and our princes and our ancestors are covered with shame. Lord, because we have sinned against you, the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. So he still relies on God's mercy there. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the law he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses... And sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. 
The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant for your sake, Lord. Look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man or angel that I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you begin to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And this should be fun for all of us. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, and then for this one, to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. No one understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be be seven sevens and then 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. And after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And in the middle of that seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up in an abomination that causes desolation until, that, until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. I hope you're mystified. This is the reading of God's word. Amen. The confession of sin is indeed a rare jewel in these days of self-fulfillment and self-seeking. So, for example, when the DOT leaves barrels out on the highway down to one lane during the 4th of July weekend, do they ever come out and confess their sins? Uh, sorry about that, folks. Uh, we had a crew out there, and they took a long siesta, and then they went home early for the weekend. Sorry about that. We never hear that, right? Confession is a rare thing. Or do we hear from our presidents, I'm really sorry about that. Read my lips, no new taxes. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I can't make Congress do what I want. Or if you, like to, you want to keep your doctor and you like him, you can keep him. We never heard, sorry, I'm making promises that I can't keep because I can't make people do what I want. What a shock it would be if Russia came out and said, you know, this invasion thing in Ukraine, it was a mistake. We're really sorry about it and we'd like to make amends. Wouldn't you be shocked if that happened? Press conference happens, right? Confession is indeed a rare thing because it requires humility. And humility is the rarest of all traits in human character. It really takes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to cultivate humility in humans. Our pride is so great, humility is so rare. The church is the only body in the whole wide world that calls its members to confess their sins. And the reason we are called to confess our sins is because God has opened our eyes. He has made us aware of our deep wickedness. And confession of sin is how God works on us with that. To admit we have sinned is the work of God in a person. It's really quite a miracle. And to turn back from one sin, 
to admit it and turn away from it is what we would say is living in the Spirit. So this is our last Old Testament passage and then our second to last for the sermon series. We come to a prayer of confession. So giving you kind of a full diet of all these different prayers, this one's really important from Daniel. As Daniel laments over the sins of his people and their hard-heartedness, he also includes himself in that, God shows Daniel he will put an end to their sin. I don't know if you caught that in verse 24, 25. He will atone for their wickedness and bring in everlasting righteousness. So where, or maybe even better, who would that come from? Context is important here. So don't jump to Israel today. And this is way back in the BCs when this is happening, okay? So some of the things that we're reading we can immediately jump to the current issues in the news. So I want to build a little bit of context here. When the Babylonians came to ransack Jerusalem, this is after Hezekiah and all the kings that we looked at, they were unstoppable. They were like a swarm of bees or a pack of lions. They attacked and they conquered and then they dragged off a lot of God's elect people back to Babylonia. The elect people were scattered into the Gentile world, which would have been almost like a curse for them. But it was all because they were unwilling to turn away from their sins and turn back to God. That's what repentance means, to turn away from your sins and turn back. The book of Daniel is written written in this setting. It has amazing miracles in it. The fiery furnace, the lion's den. King Nebuchadnezzar is turned into a wild animal. That's a worthwhile passage to spend some time in. And then there's also the, the handwriting on the wall. Nebuchadnezzar's son, that's a fascinating one too. After chapter 7, we've got all this revelation all the way through chapter 12, and it's very difficult to read. But I also suspect suspect for Daniel, this time was extremely difficult. It was a time of suffering because he was so faithful, and he knew because of the sins of his people, they had to suffer these consequences. By chapter 6, though, the unstoppable force that was Babylon had been stopped by the Persians. Another power arose, and one of the great messages out of Daniel is, kingdoms come and go, God's kingdom endures forever. Kingdoms rise to power and fall to power. Who are we worried about this time? You know, when we were growing up, I was growing up, I can't speak for all of you, it was the Soviet Union. Now who is it? China, right? This always happens, right? Kingdoms come and go. Even the U.S. is part of that. This occasion for Daniel's prayer was a prayer of confession because he had been reading Scripture, the prophecy from Jeremiah. And he was probably reading this one right here, but there's others in Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So he's thinking, now that Babylon has fallen, Is now the time, God? Is now the time that you're sending us back? He begins like every prayer should with adoration to God. And the word is the word for awesome can also be translated as terrible. So the great and terrible living God. That's an interesting way to think about that, right? Awesome. Who keeps his covenant of love. And at this point, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. So how many of you think the Ten Commandments show God's love? Maybe our definition of love is messed up and not the Ten Commandments, right? He's saying that this is a covenant of love for us. And then he intercedes and he says things like, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly and rebelled turning from your word. Open shame belongs to us. Unlike the DOT, he comes right out and says, this is what we've done, we're sorry. This is a rare and special thing, isn't it? And notice what Daniel is doing here. He's not praying for someone who's a lost sinner coming to faith. He's praying for covenantal people, raised in worship services, catechized, know the law, and they're the ones that are wayward. This is the confession. He's talking about believers, his own people who have turned away. They are exiled and under discipline, and they don't care. It's rather an amazing thing. It should give us a little perspective on what happens in the church. 
They don't care for the truth. What are we supposed to do with it? This is not the first time it's happened. And then the real focus, I think, is chapter uh, 9, verse 13. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God. So first, let me say, God was faithful to his word by exiling them. He told them in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, if you do these sins, then I'm going to do this to you. And they did not listen. And then they weep and cry when God says, I'm faithful to my word, not because you're not. Oh, well, this is the way it goes. And so what happens here is they're exiled. And so God is faithful, but we're not. Then he says, I think the most staggering thing is, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. We can never underestimate the hardness of our hearts. We should never assume that we got this. And the unwillingness to repent is directly related to that. So Daniel can only pray. He can only say, I don't know what to do with this, Lord. I don't know. I'm praying confession. I'm pouring my guts out to you. But there's such hard-heartedness here. It will require God's intervention or God's people will be no more. Now, I have an ancient artwork here for you. In 390 A.D., Emperor Theodosius ordered the massacre of some 1,500 citizens of Thessalonica. And the Thessalonians were very proud. They gave complete fealty and loyalty to the Roman Empire. But as time goes on, people forget those relationships and those agreements. And so Theodosius went after Thessalonians. This is a painting in 1600s that was trying to represent this scenario. So what did the church do at this time to the emperor? They banned him from worship services for doing this. Yes, that's what the church is supposed to do. It's supposed to offset the government, right? So, the emperor being who he was, decided to enter Milan and go to the cathedral. But then, Bishop Ambrose, if you've never read anything from Ambrose, he's a worthwhile historical character, had the emperor arrested in the foyer. Ambrose forbade him to come into the tabernacle and, and publicly confessed his sin, until he publicly confessed his sins against the Thessalonians. The emperor pleaded, well, wait a minute, bishop. If I have been guilty of homicide, so was King David, a man after God's own heart. Do you see how we do that? It wasn't a good thing that David committed murder. It wasn't something that God was proud of or David was. So this is what Ambrose says. You have imitated David in his crime, imitate him in his repentance. I don't know what happened after that. Do you see what a rare thing repentance is? How often are you confessing your sins? How long do you think you should do that? Is it once a week? Are you confessing and then repenting of your sins? It should be daily. So why is confession such a hard thing? Well, I've already hinted at it. It's a hard thing for unbelievers. It's certainly a hard thing for believers. Confession requires humility. And we have a difficult time because we are pride-filled, even if we don't mean to be. And this is why the Apostle Paul says, there is no one righteous, not even one on earth. Not one. And he's probably taking that from Ecclesiastes 7, which says, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. So we are mandated to confess our sins. It's actually part of being redeemed because we are aware of our wickedness and where we can go with our hearts. The law was given to us to teach us about our sins and it gives us this explicit standard of what righteousness is. But that also tells us that the old covenant at Mount Sinai was also still based off of grace and mercy. Because they could atone for their sins through the blood of animals. But also, Abraham, their father, in Genesis 15, was given a covenant where it was credited to him as righteousness because he lived by faith. 
Daniel's prayer reveals our own unrighteousness as God's people. That's why he says we do not make these requests because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. And this leads us to Christ. This is why he had to come, and this is why it was always part of the plan. So why then do we confess our sins? Why bother if Christ covers us? Well, there's a couple of reasons. We saw it in the catechism because it's part of our sanctification. It's part of growing humility in us. But we're also admitting our neediness, our unworthiness, our unrighteousness. And if it was not for God, we would be in exile. It's also being people of the word, as we see here with Daniel. It's part of our gratitude. So a prayer of confession and the resulting repentance should not be a rare thing for us and the church. We should be doing this often because we want to cultivate humility. So Daniel prays the following. While I was praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people, Gabriel came to me. God has a word for you and your people. And this is, I'm going to give you a paraphrase of what's going on in all this imagery. There will be lots of ups and downs, Daniel. God will bring back a remnant to Jerusalem. The temple will be rebuilt, but it won't be like before because God is bringing an everlasting righteousness. One that is not based on human obedience or the temple, but on his son's obedience. And I will use kings, anointed ones, to do this. It will be a long, slow road of obedience until the end, and your enemy will try to make you stumble, but God also has a decree for him. Now, when we get into this 77 stuff and all that, this is an interpretive minefield. I read six commentaries on this this week. None of them agree on anything. So what we want to focus on is some of the bigger picture stuff. Because sevens, for example, is a number of perfection because of creation, but it also could be 70, could also be the life expectancy of a person. You could go down every rabbit trail you would dream of and still miss the whole point. So here's what I want to focus on. What we can say is that God brings an answer to Daniel as an encouragement. And so whatever we take out of the imagery, it has to stay within that context. He's answering Daniel's prayer. Okay? He's saying, yes, your time for punishment is almost up, but it won't be the same as before because I am moving salvation and history forward. So thus all the anointed, the anointed ones can be a title for a king or it can be Jesus. And you've got Optionsville when you read this passage. Is he talking about Christ or is he talking about a king? I think some of it's a king and some of it's Christ. When it says the one who will be cut off, that's Jesus But the other anointed one is probably King Cyrus who sends the exiles back to rebuild. Now, what about this weeks and numbers and all that stuff? Um, You can have a lot of fun going online and looking up 490 years and people have these graphs and this is this kingdom and don't take those literally. You will not get the answers that you want. Do not start doing math. Remember, this is written from an Eastern mindset. It's not a Western mindset. There's no A plus B plus C here, right? It's best to understand the sevens as the perfect amount of time for God to do his sanctifying work on his people. In the end, it will be like a flood. Life will be going on. People will be marrying and doing business. And then Christ will return on the clouds. The destruction of the temple will come because we won't need a temple anymore. And we won't need animal sacrifices because... The Son will put on flesh and die on the cross and be raised. And then the Spirit will indwell the believer, and then their bodies will be the temple. And so that helps us think about who the church is when we talk about we're the body of Christ, we're the temple. This is all part of God's plan, and when the Messiah comes, he will bring an everlasting righteousness to the people of God. He won't have to confess his sins because he doesn't sin. And he won't have to repent because he's never turned from God's way or his word. He is the word become flesh. And by his death and resurrection, he will give his people a new heart and a new nature so that confession will come regularly and repentance will be normal. 
and they will be a holy people that will do the good works of God. Now, whenever my father-in-law calls me, I never know what to expect. And so this week, he gave me a, a sermon illustration, which I was very thankful for, that has to do with this passage and what happens in this passage. During their Sunday school, they're at a congregational church in Massachusetts. During the Sunday school, they were talking about, what do you do when you're convicted by a sermon or a message? What are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to act? And so he shared one time that, uh, this was years ago, the preacher was talking about stealing and all the evils of stealing, and he was really convicted because when he was a young man, he stole $20 from a gas station that he was working at. And so... After that sermon, years later, the guy who owned the gas station is retired and is elderly. He shows up to his house and confesses what he did and then gave him $60 because he says, I don't trust myself. I may have stolen more than $20, but all I remember is $20, so here's $60. And the elderly man wept and thanked him and hugged him. So see the power of confession and repentance. But it gets better than that. In that Sunday school class, there was a family that my father-in-law built a house for named the Phillips family, and the woman, the wife, was treated my father-in-law terrible while he was building the house. That was 30 years ago. She became a believer over the years and is attending the church, and they hadn't really had much interaction because of all that stuff in the past. Well, she spent a week, Mrs. Phillips spent a week convicted that my father-in-law would admit what he did, and she had this thing hanging over her. So after the next Sunday school class, she came up to him and said, I wanted to apologize to you for how I treated you 35 years ago when you were building our house. And now, I guess the wife sews, and my mother-in-law loves to sew, and now they're having a little shindig about sewing. The point is, is that confessing our sins and repenting from them changes lives. It's where the church should be honest about who we are. This is that everlasting righteousness that Christ is talking about. We're supposed to be different. We don't hide our sins. We admit them. And we just say, I was wrong and I'm sorry. And I'm going to try not to do that again. It's a powerful work of God when we see this rare thing called confession. When we admit our sins and turn from them, we are actually being the church. And I would encourage you to be open with those you trust about some things that have been weighing on your shoulders over these years, whether it's something simple like $20 from a gas station years ago or something more. God has given us his son, so there is no more room for pride or pretense, just honesty and holy living. And what's so rare in the world, confession and repentance, really should be the hallmark of our congregation. God is calling us to this because he wants to set us free from these things. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are encouraged and maybe convicted by Daniel that we have sins that we need to confess to you. Not because we're going to lose our salvation, but because it's the holy and humble thing to do. So Lord, if there's folks here who need to release some of those things that they've been hanging on to, may your spirit move them now to release and to confess to you. And may your spirit wash them and renew them and lift them up from those burdens. And Father, we know the road is long and obedience is not so fun, but it is your way and that is life-giving. And so help us to be a confessing and repenting people. This week, may we start. Right now, may we start. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your Son, for the Spirit who indwells us and makes us the temple, and for the power of confession and repentance. Forgive us 
and lift us up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In response to this, please stand and sing. If we take in all that Christ has done for us, it should bring us to our knees. Receive a blessing, and then remember we have a meeting right after. Those of you non-professing members, go grab some coffee. We'll join you shortly. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you today, now, and forevermore. Amen.